you. We're back from break. It's 11 o'clock on April 27th. And we're in the process of trying to understand some language that was shared with us uh, from uh, folks who've been working together to clarify uh, a section of S120 on the uh, 340B language, PBM, insurance company issues. Uh, I, we have reached out to Sarah Teachout to be with us this morning. If she can't be here, uh, we, will, we will reach out again and we'll bring the folk, well, you, Helen Laban, Devin Green, uh, we'll bring you back in to have a conversation with us about the language. So Jen, what I'm gonna suggest is that if you don't mind, um, I think we should have the language up to look at it. And then there are some pretty specific questions about the, the meaning of this overall. I think that um, you did bring us this recommendation and Sarah Teachout is going to be with us in about five minutes, which is good. Just had a note from her. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, I can't see everyone. So Helen or Devin, do you want to walk us through this at this point and talk about it? I think our specific question, one of our specific questions was on the uh, implication that the patient benefits from this. So why don't you tell, why don't you talk with us about what the problem is and then how this solves the problem? Senator Cummings, I think you were going to say the same thing. I was going to say, I don't understand what the problem is we're trying to solve. Thank you. Good. So Devin and Helen, I'll turn it over to you collectively and you can help us understand what the problem is and how language in this bill might solve that problem. Sure. So Helen Laban by State Primary Care Association. Uh, this language is responding to a very specific action by uh, pharmacy benefit managers, and, and in particular, Express Scripts has done this federally. It is a move to increase the regulatory, or the, sorry, the administrative burden on pharmacies around 340B uh, drug prescriptions by changing the system by which they need to report, uh, file claims for um, prescribed drugs that are going to a 340B entity. And the, in, the background intent of that move by the PBMs was to both have a chilling effect on participation in 340B and also set up a structure by which they might in the future uh, change the pricing on those drugs that are, that are um, in 340B. Nationally, there is not anything, there's safeguards on the 340B program broadly, but there isn't anything nationally that protects against this particular way of getting at the PBM's goal, reducing participation in 340B. However, if states have something on the books in state statute that says you can't uh, add in additional regulatory or administrative burdens on top of participating pharmacies, then the PBMs, including Express Scripts, have been um, honoring the state statute. So this is very, very narrow. This is part of a national effort state by state to address this problem. I think North Dakota passed it yesterday. West Virginia is in Utah. Um, Tennessee is looking at it, Ohio. So th this, is a, this is a movement by a lot of different states to address this issue. And so it is a very targeted piece of legislation that's simply trying to cut off that avenue before all PBMs start down it. And, and as I said, it's part of a, a national effort in this regard. Um, and we did originally take um, statutory language from what was being seen in other states that worked with Blue Cross Blue Shield to adjust it to make sure that it was appropriately narrowly targeted to this one issue that we're dealing with. So that's the intent of this uh, language, which is why it probably reads a little bit funny because it is so very targeted. Can you put uh, before you, uh, De Devin, was that you? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. I was just going to say the effect of what Express Scripts is doing is if the pharmacy doesn't comply within 10 days, they lose the entire Express Scripts contract, which creates a real access issue um, and is a pretty draconian response. 
So can you explain that clearly for the committee? Because it sounds like this then would have an effect on patients. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and Helen can jump in too. I think there's a short-term and a potential long-term effect, right? So they're saying pharmacies, if you don't do this within 10 days, um, you'll lose your contract with Express Scripts, which creates an access problem for patients. And then the other piece is, as Helen mentioned, it's potentially setting up um, prescription drugs that are flagged that may have their prices changed later to reduce the amount of subsidies that healthcare providers receive from the 340B program. So that would go towards the access around, you know, a lot of healthcare providers rely on 340B funding and um, if it's cut or if part of it is lost, that could potentially lead to, um, uh, you know, loss of access in other areas like services and other things. Right, I, I, I would concur. Um, our, so the, the impact of this legislation on the patients is preserving the integrity of that 340B program, which is being used to reduce drug costs. It's also being used, for example, many of my members use it to invest in prevention, right? So they'll use it for uh, healthy food programs with schools and with children and families, you know, to prevent those chronic diseases such as type two diabetes that require drugs down the road. So it's a, it's a really, um, strong approach and a strong component of what the FQHCs and other um, participants in 340B are, are, are doing to serve Vermonters. And we don't want uh, that funding to be diverted to, to P national PBM companies. We, we want it to come to Vermont to serve Vermonters is what we would like to have happen. <laughs> Senator Hooker, go ahead. Thank you. So thank you. Um, women for being here and clarifying this, but but to be clear, this isn't going to affect, and neither does any of the 340B programming affect the cost of drugs for um, cons for consumers. But it helps the providers to provide services um, that they would otherwise not be able to provide because the cost for them for drugs would be at a higher rate. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Okay. Yes, I, I would say the FQHCs often do pass on the savings, so it can be used to reduce the price, but you're correct in that the mechanism goes through the practices to the patient. It's not a, it's not a, um, an automatic discount, like 25% off all drugs in Vermont right. sort of thing. Okay. Um, and we are, and I should say that this legislation is preserving the status quo. That's all we're trying to do is not move backwards in what's currently available. So, so that's what this is attempting to achieve. Okay, thank you. Senator Cummings. You're muted, Senator. I thought I understood some of this. The 340B is a federal program, right? Yes. And that's where the FQHCs and the hospitals buy their drugs at a certain rate. How do the pharmacy, where do the pharmacy benefit managers get to play in this? <laughs> well, they're sort of the middle man, right? So I'm, I'm, 340B drugs go through a PBM? Um, this is Sarah. I can jump in. Thank you, Sarah. Please do. Welcome, Sarah Teacher. I'm raising my hand, but I don't think you can see it. <laughs> no, go right ahead. This is a conversation. Um, yes. So, Sarah Teachout, um, I represent Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, and health insurance companies use 340B or um, pharmacy benefit managers to um, operationalize essentially the drug benefit for our members. And so the 340 or the PBM contracts with the 340B pharmacy and with all other pharmacies. And when a commercially insured member goes to get their prescription drug filled at one of these pharmacies, it's the PBM that ma manages the, you know, the administration of that purchase. So um, I think I emailed you, but 
commercial, commercially insured patients pay the full price for these drugs. And it's the spread on the low price that the 340p B pharmacy gets the drug for and the amount that they sell it to the commercially insured patient for, that's where they make their revenue. Um, you know, the, the rebate piece is arcane for sure. Um, when we contract with a PBM, we look to these rebates to lower the prices for our members because we build in the price of drugs into the premium. And we also include what we anticipate the rebates to be. So when we start losing these rebates, what will happen is premiums will increase. And that's our concern here. Um, I did want to also say that until this July, um, ESI has been the PBM representing and working for Blue Cross. We are switching to a new PBM starting in July that I don't believe is um, using these practices. Um, so it, there'll be a shift at least from Blue Cross's perspective on how this works. Um, and we really would like the study to look at what's happening with the rebates and who's being impacted. And that's why we have the piece there about looking at the impact on patients, um, commercially insured patients, as well as the impact on the 340B pharmacies. Okay, so who would like to help us go through the language here? So could, Helen, can you please restate the problem that we are addressing? And then as we go through this, language, how that language resolves or solves that problem or begins to. Helen, can you do that? Certainly, I can, I can, I can state the problem. Uh, this is uh, Sarah's language to which we have agreed, so I don't want to uh, overstep into her lane and walking through the language that she clearly uh, knows very well since she wrote it. Uh, the problem that we are attempting to resolve is that uh, I say PBMs plural, Express Scripts, as, as Sarah mentioned, was the first one to, to actually uh, do this. They have added an additional um, administrative requirement onto pharmacies who want to participate in 340B that they, that they use a new modifier system to identify those 340B claims at the time of filing the claim. And they have given a very short turnaround to come into compliance or, your, or the pharmacy cannot participate as part of the 340B program. As Devin indicated, we, the pharmacies in Vermont have found it impractical to comply that quickly um, with this rule. So this language would prohibit them from uh, implementing this new administrative burden. It would additionally, as Sarah indicated, have a, uh, I don't know sure if it's called a commissioner or a task force, a, a group with DFR and, and the AG's office to look at the, that bigger problem. So this is a, this is a, um, a year long temporary fix at, during which time we will have these entities who do have deep knowledge in this world, uh, look at the issue and, and report back with a longer term solution. Okay, that, that, that actually begins to make some sense, I think, and helpful. Um, so uh, there was a communication between and among you all. I have a two questions. One, you've included the Attorney General's office here. Um, can you explain that? Um, this is Sarah, and I, I will admit that I did not ask the Attorney General's office if this is okay, but they do, um, you know, do some reporting um, to the legislature, I believe, um, on what is happening with drug pricing um, and so have some you know work in this space already um, I, I think we felt like either the ag's office or the department of financial regulation had sort of the appropriate connections with national um, uh, organizations that could help them do this work and we have since reached out to the attorney general's office and they agree that they have that expertise and can participate in this Oh, thank you, Helen. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so that, that answers one of the questions. And there was also the concern about the date of January 15th. And I think the last email I received this morning or late last night um, was that that date might be July 1st uh, instead of, was it December 31st? 
uh, was it the December 31st, 2022 date that would be changed? I'm trying to right. remember so what the dates were. It's the effective date. And if you look down under four, mm -hmm. um, the way it's drafted here, it takes effect immediately and expires at the end of 2022. Um, I, I'm not sure if it can take effect immediately. I, I don't really know okay. how quickly this could happen. Um, and then we were trying to decide whether a year made sense or through a calendar year. Um, you know, plan years aren't exactly the same. For example, Blue Cross um, contracts with the PBM on a fiscal year. We do July 1st to July 1st. So I, I wasn't sure what the right time period made the most sense. Okay. What would be the recommendation from the group? I think we would recommend starting on July 1st. I, I, I'm always okay. 2021. About... <laughs> right. And then it could go for a year. Okay. I think we would like it to start immediately just because this this is happening now. Um, yep. And so understanding that it may not be able to happen right away, but we we would rather it go into effect sooner rather than later. Yeah. So it would it would take away the three or four months for someone to impose an administrative burden of some type. I got it. Okay, I understand that. Okay, um, so Jen, do you have specific questions about the language you're looking at or is that something that you can sort out? Well, I think the one that I'm not sure was talked about yet was this um, in the report language, the possible state approaches to the developing issue of um, pharmaceutical manufacturers ceasing to pay rebates to commercially insured Vermonters. And we were, <laughs> I think, confused about how the, about manufacturer rebates directly to Vermonters. And is that what was intended or is this, is this a different problem? What is this? Right. Good question. They don't pay the rebate directly to the Vermonter. <laughs> um, maybe to benefit Vermonters. Take away, you're suggesting that, so that's something I think that we need to resolve because that right now it's inaccurate. So, uh, right. I think I need to understand if, if this is the issue, is the issue really about the manufacturers and, and paying rebates to however you want to say it to benefit Vermonters or is it about the PBMs um, not passing along the rebate? I don't, I don't, I need help framing, I think, framing this particular issue. I wonder if it's more manufacturers ceasing to pay 340B prices or to participate in the 340B program. I don't know, Sarah. And if you so is the, I mean, I, this seems to be looking more at rebates, uh, at, right, at, at manufacturers and rebates and less at PBMs, anything having to do with PBMs going forward. Right, so the source of the problem is that the pharmaceutical manufacturers have stopped paying rebates for drugs that are being, prescriptions that are being filled through 340B pharmacies. That's sort of the- just, isn't, but, but isn't what, that a requirement of the, of their purchase, I mean, if they're selling their drugs in the Medicaid program, isn't that sort of one of the underpinnings of the 340B program? But they're, uh, what I'm understanding is they're putting an administrative uh, burden on the pharmacist so that um, once that's in place, then they don't have to pay the rebates. I'm... Well, the PBMs are doing that, but there are some manufacturers. This is all part of what's happening with 340B right now. There are some manufacturers who have just refused to pay the 340B price on some drugs. Um, and so I don't know if that is supposed to be looking at that or if it's looking at rebates. So yeah, here's my, uh, yeah. So uh, Senator Hardy, before you ask your question, my suggestion is going to be that this language obviously has isn't isn't clear. So we need to add clarity to this. Uh, otherwise, it's not helpful. So uh, what I'm going to suggest is that that. Helen, Devin, 
Sarah work with Jen to bring clarity to this. And this would be something that we, we can look at tomorrow morning. But so, but go ahead, Senator Hardy. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for that suggestion. Cause it seems to me that one and two are directed at trying to solve a problem that's been brought on by pharmacy benefit managers. And three is trying to solve a problem that is apparently because of pharmaceutical manufacturers. So there, there's a disconnect between those two. And if we're trying to solve the first problem, then wouldn't we want the report to be on how to solve the first problem? And if we're trying to solve the second problem, then we need to have more information about what that second problem is. Um, so it, it, there's just a disconnect between one and two and three. And, and that's three. where I got very confused <laughs> as to who, who is the causing the problem. It sounds like maybe there are two problems to solve, but it, that's not clear in this language. So comments from I, I Helen, do, Sarah, Devin. I, I would say that I think that the underlying theme here is that we regret that we were caught a little bit off guard such that one or one and bills one and two were necessary at a late stage in the legislative session and we would like to now get out ahead of what is going to be happening nationally so that we aren't in this situation again so i, I believe the number three is meant to be inclusive of multiple brewing national issues including this one so that we aren't having these rush discussions at the end of the session in 2022, but instead have a proactive approach to what we what we're going to accomplish. So that that I, I I do understand that to be the case, but it's not clear that that's the case. So my suggestion again is for you folks to put your heads together and work. Jen, does that make sense from your perspective to work? Uh, with those with them and um, and keep us in the loop uh, so that we can come back to this tomorrow morning. We'll put it on our agenda. Uh, first thing, what we usually start at. I'm now. not available at first thing, but I can probably. What time are you available? Because I think I can be here because I have a bill going in the house. Um, okay. I think 1030, they move to a different topic that I will, I can catch up on. Okay, so we'll put it on our agenda um, for 10 o'clock, 10, uh, 10, 15, how's that? We'll, we, can, we'll, we can firm that up a little bit. Madam Chair, can I just add one quick thing also? When sure. you're looking at it, the effective date language seems a little funky. Yeah, um, oh yeah, that's not, yes, I will. I will. There's a lot there. I, okay. I need, yes, I need to better understand the intent there and then I will do it as, either just session law language or um, a prospective repeal of statutory language. Okay, thank you, Jen. Yes. Okay, so let's take the language down for okay. now. And I guess one question for the committee okay. is, did you, I think you heard different uh, testimony from, from different witnesses about whether the language would take effect on passage or on July 1st, and did you make a decision on that? Well, I would recommend uh, on passage simply because if we don't put it on passage, there's a period of time within which administrative decisions can be made that will interrupt the 340B program. Decisions by PBMs or maybe one in particular. I just wanted to confirm that because you, yeah. you'd heard. If, unless the committee Thanks. disagrees with that, I would say that. Okay. All right. So let's, let's do this. Uh, we, I think we now are getting closer on that section. I, Sarah, you also sent me an email this morning. Um, wasn't even first thing, it was later in the morning. Uh, so I think it was nine o'clock uh, about the section on the administrative costs for insurance. Um, can you, uh, that is section sure. number. Is it nine or 10? I'm I think trying. it's section seven. Which one? <laughs> I think off. it's section seven. Um, and so I-, I Yes, section first seven. First of all, we, uh, um, we provide a ton of information both to the Department of Financial Regulation and to um, 
the Green Mountain Care Board about our administrative costs, um, as do all insurers. And so if you're gonna have this additional report, I would recommend including additional information. Um, and the, the two pieces that I would note is that there are a number of um, contributing factors going into Blue Cross's administrative costs. One of those are the Green Mountain Care Board bill back, which has increased by on average 17% a year since 2016. Um, and then the other thing is the state's shifting of costs that were typically before this borne by the state of Vermont and general fund dollars, which is the billing for Vermont Health Connect, which is now also being shifted to health insurers administrative costs, um, as well as the costs to administer healthcare reform for the state of Vermont. So we've spent um, millions to change our computer systems to enable the capacity to do capitated payments. Um, so these are all costs that are drivers of administrative costs. And so to just compare simply health insurer administrative costs to the CPI is um, not a very thorough picture of what's happening. So and this, as you understand it, is a Green Mountain Care Board um... This is a report from the Green Mountain Care Board. So um, I think this is an opportunity for the legislature to look at some of the issues that you're talking about because one of the things that Blue Cross and Blue Shield has done that is very commendable is to work with our uh, healthcare reform efforts. So, so it's, not, it's not a negative, this is not all negative. So, but you're suggesting that if we're looking at this, we should ask for, um, broader descriptors. Uh, right, because the what this study asks for right now is just health insurer administrative costs and compare them to the CPI. All right, well, um, can, can, yeah. Without uh, any other information. Pretty, pretty cut out. and dry, right? Uh, why don't we do this? <laughs> well, it would be helpful uh, if you don't mind uh, providing us with perhaps some categories of information that might inform um, this a little bit better. We can decide as a committee whether or not we want to um, keep this section in the bill after we've looked at that, It'd be helpful. We don't, I'm not interested in having administrative burden, but it is a Green Mountain Care Board report. And if the data is there and it helps us understand what's going on in the insurance world administratively, I think that's helpful. Senator Cummings and then Senator Hardy. I think though, it, administrative cost, in order to get a clear picture, we need to add in the things that Sarah listed. There's a cost to doing the things we're asking insurers to do and we need it's like unfunded mandates to schools. You got it. <laughs> you, you, exactly. And so sometimes the administrative cost is a result of us. Right. <laughs> Not I think. Senator Hardy. Um, thanks. I was just, um, this was language that you had had requested madam chair and so i was again yep. just sort of like what's the problem we're trying to solve i mean because it's not very well defined. it's not fleshed out and so yeah. we'll look and see what uh sarah if you don't mind bringing us some clarification of what would help us understand the administrative costs um and then we can decide as a committee to include this as a report from the green mountain care board or not That's it. We hear consistently that administrative costs are too high. And then we ask for things like participation in uh, healthcare reform efforts and all payer efforts uh, without understanding that there is an administrative cost associated with that. So some of that needs to be is on our shoulders, on us. Okay. So anything else that, so Sarah, thank you for that. And Helen, 
and Devin, thank you. Um, and you can reach out or Jen will be reaching out to try to put together some language that makes sense to us and that does articulate and solve the problem all at once. Be helpful. Okay. So committee, uh, so we're, I think we're finished with that part of S120 or those sections of S120. Um, that so many states are reacting to this uh, across uh, the country, I think is a is an important uh, important for us to know. The, so Jen, on S120, as it goes forward, uh, we had talked in committee about uh, making a committee bill, but it seems like that becomes complicated. And we're known for complicated in our committee, but we don't need that for this bill. So do you want me to put it back as a uh, strike all to S120? I think, unless the committee disagrees, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it has been confusing to, for some people, people not to know what the, well, what the bill number is. 2,488. Um, and where it goes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. It keeps it, it keeps it um, where it belongs. Senator Hooker, when you were in appropriations, the issue came up, I understand. If you want to, they were just questioning what the number was going to be and what they, you know. So I think Jen is correct that it could be simpler if we just kept it the way it was. Keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that? Okay, it still has a bit of a way. So let's try to uh, solidify our work on S120 tomorrow morning. And then our clerk can take a vote. Did we actually take a vote, Nellie, on Friday? Um, I believe we did. Um, I'll double check that. I'll review we my records. We didn't do of any action. paperwork. Okay. Did you do paperwork? Just taking the vote. Senator Terenzini? Well, Having voted in the positive, I'd like to have a reconsideration of my vote on S120. So, Senator Lyons, sir, to interrupt, we had a, a positive vote of S20, S120 of a 500. Oh, it was a 500. All right. Having voted in the positive, I would like to ask the committee if I might reconsider my vote. It was a vote on a committee bill, was it not, Senator Terenzini? This was, yes. Yep, yeah, okay. I would like to uh, reconsider my vote. What Is does there that, any- What does that mean? That? <laughs> that means that we, if you, if you agree with me and allow for me to reconsider my vote, then the vote on Friday becomes null and void and we start over. Okay. Oh. Sure. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's, that's proper procedure. Got it. <laughs> all right. Is anyone not all those in favor of allowing for me to reconsider my vote? Aye. Say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Okay. Aye. So now, uh, committee, I'd like. Uh, why don't we hold off on a further vote on S one twenty, and uh, until tomorrow, and we'll try to do what needs to be done to the sections. Senator Hooker. So this just negates the whole committee bill and what Jen will bring us tomorrow will be the strike all that I'll be reporting on. Okay. Thank yes. You. That we, that, that hopefully we'll get to a good place with the PBM language or 340B language. If not, it's gone. All Madam right. Chair. Yeah. <laughs> After all of our gymnastics with this bill, is there even a, do you know about a path for it <laughs> given the late date we're working on that okay we're Thank working you. on that appreciate yeah. the There's nothing i i really would like to have this bill go forward i think it's very important for it to go forward so um i had a conversation with the pro tem yesterday about it and we're working on it great thank you yeah 
Okay, anything else on that one? Okay, so we have a little bit of time so you can start to contact people on the um, Children and Families Council for Prevention okay. or not. Anything else? All right, Nellie, we're good.